Hi, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. So I think this podcast is going to trigger you. In fact, that's kind of what we're attempting to do here, but not in a bad way, <laughs> not in a bad way. Uh, in some ways, I would, I would say, Antonia, that our career is you and me running around with microphones and cameras trying to trigger people. And then when they get triggered about some issue that surfaces for them, we help them deal with that using the lens of personality type. We basically mm. help them address the triggers that come up for them on how their mind is wired. And that's basically what we do. I mean, if you really boil it down, that's that's one way you could describe our career here at Personality Hacker. Well, maybe you should, we should define what the word trigger means in this context. Yeah. Because I think as much as this word has become a staple in our language and our collective unconscious, I don't I don't think that we're all using the same definition of trigger. But I do think that we all believe we know what a trigger is. Mm. And I think we all, when we make accusations or make statements that you triggered me, I think we have collectively gotten to a place where we all agree that that's a bad thing. I agree with you. I remember growing up in the 1980s as a kid and seeing movies and TV shows that would uh, portray Vietnam veterans that they were home from the war and something would happen. They'd be at a July 4th celebration, fireworks would go off and they would like dive under a picnic table and freak out or pull a gun on somebody that they felt was threatening. And you see all of these tropes in like 90s, 80s and 90s movies growing up or TV shows. And that's how I always understood what a trigger was. It was always like a like after a war, after some traumatic event, after like your life was threatened, something happened to remind you of the life-threatening situation you had been in at one time. And you were respond. Your psychology was responding to the stimuli as if you were threatened again. So mm-hmm. fireworks sounds like gunfire or bombs. You dive under tables and you feel like you have to protect yourself against that. That's how I always understood triggers until maybe the last five, ten years. And now what I'm seeing is a trigger is anything that makes me feel uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And now I don't know if that's how people actually define it in their heads. But in practice, that's how I see a lot of people at least behaving around the concept of triggers. Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't even know if I knew the word trigger when I was younger. But people who were dealing, and it wasn't just World War, I mean, it wasn't just Vietnam. It was also, I mean, we were, we were kids when, you know, the vets of World War II were still, you know, the grandparents, right? Yeah. They well, weren't they were right grandparents. grandparents. Yeah, yeah, they weren't like... Basically, that generation is complete. Uh, and they had been, you know, they had either fought in World War II or they were Korean war vets. And the word I always knew for this was um, being shell shocked, right? And shell shocked was like a big deal. It was, like you said, Fourth of July fireworks would go off and it would take somebody back to an incredibly, like, like an experience a human shouldn't have. Yeah. Right. Like we're not really built to be able to we're resilient and we've experienced a lot of bad, ter- you know, and terrible things as humans. But we're not really built to sustain that kind of situation without a lot of repair work afterwards. Like the human body can sustain a lot of trauma, but you might just always walk with a limp. And I think the human psyche can sustain a lot of trauma, but it also might limp along a little bit if the situation was bad enough. And being shell-shocked was, it was the word that people used before they knew the phrase PTSD. Of course, these global wars were also coming, I mean, they were, they were happening at approximately the same time that the field of psychology was coming of age. And so it wasn't just a phenomena that people had to deal with. You know, these farmers that had gone to war as mercenaries in times past and then came home and then there was no, you know, resources or facility for them to get over whatever it was that they had seen. They came home and people studied them. And what ended up happening was this idea of being shell-shocked. There was, there was a lot of crossover with the same kinds of behaviors and mentalities and experiences that people had, had um, you know, that, that they showed up with when they had really traumatic childhoods like the kinds of childhoods that are almost unspeakable. And so then it wasn't, the the word shell-shocked was no longer an appropriate word because it wasn't just for wartime vets. 
It was now for people who had experienced any sort of extraordinary trauma. And then the phrase, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder became fashionable in the psychological world. So now we have PTSD. And that opens up, you know, people from a lot of different terrible, terrible experiences to be able to be seen for the situation that they're going through. And so triggers became anything that produced an emotional response in individuals that had had terrible circumstances of the past. Like it was something that put them back in those moments and had them relive it and had them go into maybe even, uh, you know, fight, flight or freeze space. Then a little bit later down the line, as psychology continues to study people and the effects of trauma on them, eventually we got to phrases like complex PTSD, which was more of a low grade. It wasn't the quality of the experience, quality as in like qualitatively extreme. It was more like the quantity of the experience. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of little hits against a person, which creates what they call now CPTSD, complex post-traumatic stress disorder. And I think all of these have been a real service to humanity, understanding all of these things, understanding that we can really struggle to, uh, to uh, you know, source these terrible things that come up for us, these situations where we're at the mercy of our psychology that's just trying to work through something that, that we should never have experienced. And so I think at its point of origin, the concept of triggers and PTSD is, I, I mean, it's a huge, almost like it's a techni- technological leap for psychology. Yeah. It's a, um, it's a technology of understanding that helps people deal with things that in times past they would just have, you know, they and everybody in their ecosystem would have had to have suffered through. And then they were dead and that was it. Now we have a way to, you know, to build tools and resources to help people get through some of these really terrible things that they've experienced. I think you're right. I think there are a lot of tools, mental health tools that we have now that we didn't have before. And I think that's an amazing thing. I think that having the resources for somebody that went through a traumatic event of the past in their childhood, in their past life, and they feel traumatized by that. They need to get through it. We have therapy. We have psychology. We have these, what is it, cognitive behavioral therapy that can help people work through different issues. Mm-hmm. It's a good thing. And the other thing, too, I just want to mention as well is I would like to address how personality type relates to possibly triggers mm. and unpack how we would understand people to be triggered based on their type at some point. Maybe it's this episode, maybe another episode in the future. But I would definitely like to have us look at that too, because I think that could be a really interesting conversation about how type and triggers interplay with each other. Yeah, I think so too. I I don't think we're talking though in this conversation about that traumatic level of trigger. Mm. We're not talking about somebody that came back from the Vietnam War. And we're not necessarily talking about somebody that had massive childhood trauma or, you know, suffered some type of abuse or some trauma in their childhood. Unspeakable things. That that right. needs professional level therapy and tools to be able to work through that. I think if you're a person listening right now, that that's your situation. Our encouragement to you is to go get the professional help and find the professional resources that can help you move through those and heal from that. Like if there's true healing that has to happen, that needs to happen. And we encourage you to go find those resources. You're right. Well, because it's going to take years to get through. So uh, it, it's a uh, it's it, it's real. It's valid. It needs to be honored and seen and understood, and it needs to not be diminished in any way. That people go through and deal with really terrible things. Yeah. But just like all technology, eventually becomes democratized, right? Like something that was a computer that took up an entire room to help people get to the moon in the '60s is now. Um, currently being used to film me, right? Like the the equivalent technology is right now being used to film me as I'm talking on a podcast with just insane amounts of technological, you know, like like things that, I mean, it's truly black box thinking. I have absolutely no idea what goes into any of this, but I carry it around in my pocket. And so that level of technology was democratized just like all technologies are democratized. 
And one of the things that got democratized was the technology of under, understanding psychological trauma and triggers. And it was democratized in a way that it became so accessible that people now feel like they just, they get to own that thing. They just get to have it. Uh, it's it's the, the barrier of entry for being somebody who experiences triggers around trauma is now very low. Very little can cause a trigger in a person and very little can be considered a trauma. And that's just what happens, right? Once, we, once we're once we aware of something, we, we as individuals want to be a part of that thing as well. So uh, it's not to, to it's not, th this acknowledgement is not to pick on anybody. It's not to say, well, only people who say, you know, woke up next to their friend in battle with their guts over their face from having been shelled are the only people who are allowed to experience PTSD or only people who had unspeakable things done to them in childhood are allowed to claim a trauma and say that they don't want to be triggered, right? It's not a matter of trying to create distinctions around, you know, like, like, all right, you have to have had this terrible a circumstance in order to qualify for saying, please don't trigger me. It's, it's not a game of hierarchy. It's more a question of when does a trigger stop being something that needs to be uh, carefully handled? And when does a trigger start to become something we need to seek? And that's not an idea I hear anybody talking about necessarily unless you're in cognitive behavioral therapy. C CBD, cognitive behavioral therapy, is one of the few technologies that really understands this concept. And I, I really respect that field because of it. But they also go through a lot of very complex things to get a person from point A to point B. So even within that, there's a lot, there's a lot to it. That said, there is a moment when avoidance is the wrong tool, right? And even I would argue when a person is dealing with something as big as what we were talking about before, those like traumas with a capital T, those also should not be avoided. They should be handled carefully. But there's a moment when avoiding triggers to not have to deal with what we are calling traumas, and I would call them traumas with a lowercase t, maybe not even trauma, maybe just high discomfort or pain. There's a moment when avoiding things that point those out is now to our detriment. It's actually causing trauma as opposed to avoiding, you know, exacerbating it. Well, I'll posit this idea that all triggers, all, all of this trauma, all of these triggers, the only solution is an inner solution. Now, we just talked about if you go through trauma, seek out professional help and resources to help you, but your therapist can't heal you from your trauma. They can guide you through the healing process. The healing still happens from within you. And I think that's whether it's extreme trauma or a low-grade trigger or, you know, low-grade trauma with a, with a lowercase t. I think all of it's inner work. Like, 100%. There's nothing you can do in the outside world to fix the inner space. You have to do it from within. That's my personal belief. And I think it probably bears out. I mean, I, I can't... I would love for someone to show me how an external solution can fix an internal problem. I don't think it can. Well, I think in things like cognitive behavioral therapy, there are certain exercises people can do. Certainly. And I would argue that the way that I'm talking about triggers and seeking them out as opposed to avoiding them because avoiding them causes more harm than good. The trigger itself is an external world, you know, sort of catalyst. Sure. Sure. So there are components. Anything that's inner work is going to have some external work, you know, components to it and vice versa. Anything that's external work is going to have inner work components. But I would agree that the vast majority of it is it's an inside job. It's yeah. an inner game situation. So how I see it then is something that triggers me. And again, I'm just going to let's just can we just table the traumatic people that definitely need professional help? Like if you're a person that needs professional help, we're not talking to you. We're talking to somebody that is not at the level of needing a professional therapist to overcome something in their life. Yeah, we're not talking about like like uh, the kind of therapy that would be equivalent to somebody going through 
you know, like a, a, a really traumatic car accident. And yeah. now they have years of physical therapy ahead yeah. of them and years of emotional and psychological therapy ahead yeah. of them. Right. And, and because of those people, this is a risky podcast for us to do because people might conflate what we're saying to those people. We're not talking to the, to, no. if that's you, that's, we're not speaking to you. So I'll just say that it's good to go through life and have triggers fire up something that comes inside of me. As I walk through life and I get triggered about things in my external world, I think that's a good thing. And I think you listening should go through your life actively trying to get triggered as much as you can. Now, don't do it if you're under-resourced. Don't do it if you don't have the availability to overcome. I mean, I wouldn't throw myself in a situation if I have no, I've no sleep. I'm under, I haven't eaten anything all day. I'm stressed out emotionally. I don't have money in my bank account. I'm not going to go and actively seek a trigger in that moment. So again, what I say, use with discretion. But I think it's a good thing for us as people to walk through life, get triggered, and then deal with the material that surfaces after that trigger. I think that's literally what personal growth is all about. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage you to do that. As a person invested in personal growth and wanting to understand yourself more and your personality, find out the ways that you can trigger yourself to look at these things and deal with them. Yeah. Well, I, and the reason why this is such a touchy topic is because, you know, like you said, we're not talking about people who are dealing with trauma with a capital T. It's like, well, you have to create a distinction between what if what you're going through is comma is trauma with a capital T or pain and discomfort or even trauma with a lowercase t. So every person gets to decide that. But we want to I think we want to make an argument for not jumping into that pool too quickly. Yeah. And there's a couple different reasons why. The first one is that we have all sorts of ulterior motivations for why we do what we do that we don't, we're often not even cognizant or aware of ourselves. And in a time period in history where we recognize that we have collective trauma with a capital T, we do. I think as, I, I think we're at a place of enough physical comfort and having our baseline needs met time-wise as a, as a society, right, in, at least in our culture, that a bunch of ancient trauma that wasn't even ours to begin with might be the trauma of our quote-unquote ancestors. I know that probably sounds woo-woo, but let's just pretend that there's ancestral trauma. And I've heard this phrase, generational trauma, a lot. And I always think of, you know, just as a species, we have we have trauma. There, it's traumatic to be alive and has been for hundreds of thousands of years. It is trauma or has been traumatic for our ancestors to get us to the point that we're at now. It, it's, tra it's traumatic for a baby to be born. Like a yeah. baby comes out traumatized, like its head's misshapen. It's like crying. <laughs> it's like covered in slime. Like, yeah. And it's perfectly healthy, but it was like a traumatic event for both mother and child yeah. just to come into the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, just existence is traumatic, right? And so the trauma that accompanies humanness, we, I believe we're at a place, at least in this country, where we are, we have our baseline needs met enough as a collective, right? Not every single individual person, but as a collective, it feels like this is the first time where we have enough of those needs met where all of a sudden that ancient trauma is just sort of hitting us. And we're like, oh, we need to process this. We need to do something about it. And so we're at a place because we are more in touch with that. We have like more of a fingers tapped into the energy of doing healing work, you know, as a species that we're we know that when a person needs healing, we have to be very gentle with them. We have to be gentle with people who, you know, it's like somebody twists their ankle and they're elevated on a couch. You're not going to just go like sit on top of them, right? You're going to like you know, prop their ankle up with the pillow and ask them if they need anything, right? You're going to be nice and gentle and sweet to them while this part of them is healing. And so there is an increased sensitivity that we have collectively, understandably, because we can feel whether or not we communicate or articulate this, we can feel that we're in a time period of healing, like all of us are. That said, there's also a um, there's because it's a social component, it's not just an individual component. Like if you twist your ankle and you need to prop up your, your leg for a while, it's not like that's really going to have any sort of interpersonal 
consequences as a general rule. I mean, maybe it does. Maybe you live with roommates and they're all pissed off that you're taking up the couch the entire time. And now you have to deal with like, you know, salty roommates. Or maybe you're in a house where, you know, the person who is the most... Uh, the the most wounded at the moment gets all of the attention. Well, now we do have a social component. And there is a percentage of society that acts like trauma, like the healing work we need to do is the annoying roommate that's taking up the couch. And there's a percentage of society that acts like that person we all need to organize around and treat them like they're gold. And because of that, and because we all have an instinct to go one direction or the other, there is a percentage of society that has picked up on this, and they like being the person that everybody's organizing around and treating very nice and and getting water for them and getting them a cup of tea because they don't feel good. And we end up maybe even over or, you know, overblowing, overinflating the amount of trauma that people are experiencing because we don't want to unintentionally harm anybody while they're dealing with this collective ancient healing work that needs to be done. By the same token, there's a percentage of people who act like the, you know, the the salty roommates who everybody thinks is a terrible person, right? That's a terrible person. But if it exists, if the message exists, somebody needs to hear it. That's basically how everything works. There's no single message that anybody can state, which is the one message everybody needs to hear for all time, including right this moment. Every message is a message somebody needs to hear at some point. Now, you might not need to hear it. It might not be the right message for you at this moment in the timeline, but somebody needs to hear it. And the message may not be the words being used it might be the subtext of the message being sent. Right. So I'm thinking about a really visceral example. The moment I mention it, you listening, you're going to know what I'm talking about. At the time this recording, this happened very recently. So you might be listening years from now, but it's still a cultural moment that we're all going to remember. Chris Rock, a comedian, is on stage at the Oscars, the Academy Awards in Los Angeles, Hollywood. He says something about, about Will Smith's wife and her hair. Will Smith gets triggered in that moment for whatever reason, walks up and slaps Chris Rock on the stage. We've all seen this video. We all know the cultural reference. This is what I hear you saying. I'm immediately thinking of that example going, what message did Will Smith and his wife need to hear then? Really? They need to hear a joke about her hair? That's not what you're saying. There was another subtext message that was coming from Chris Rock's joke about their relationship dynamic, about their insecurities. They were hearing a message about their insecurities and their worries about their station in life, and I'm not their experience, but a bunch of other stuff. The material wasn't the words being used. The trigger was something else, probably for both of them. Uh, Will Smith actually acted upon it. But this was a triggered moment. And I would argue that is not a a traumatic level of therapy. That's that's the kind of trigger we're talking about. Somebody gets triggered about something someone said in a joke, in a, in a quote-unquote innocent way. Now, maybe it was a mean thing to say. I'm not saying it wasn't mean. I'm just saying that's what we mean by a trigger in this format that we're talking about. Right. Well, and maybe the message is to the rest of society that nobody is above be, being you know, poked fun at. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's the message. And maybe it's not for the, you know, the people who were the subject of the joke. Maybe it's for society to remember that everybody's human and we all have things that we can poke fun at. But it was, it was interesting to see just how many people were really upset with Chris Rock making that joke. And we've seen comedians kind of coming under a lot of attack lately because they're, quote unquote, triggering people in their audiences. People yeah. are getting attacked on stage. There's a lot of backlash. And these are people that got a ticket to go to that event that are getting triggered. Like they put themselves in that context. Right. It wasn't like the comedians wrote, you know, Chris, uh, was it Dave Chappelle has this really interesting talk about a woman that followed him out to his car to complain about his his set. And he's like... Did I follow you to your car and do my act? Like, are you serious? Like, you're going to invade my life like this? Like, you came to my stuff. Right. Whether you like him or not, just disregard that. The point is, these people aren't following you to the house. They're, you're inviting this into your, into your life, going to one of their shows, and then you're having that trigger moment, and then you're responding. Seems crazy to me. This happens all the time, though. Yeah. Well, and I think the people who were the most salty at the comedian that made the joke are the kind of people who see everything as a twisted ankle. Yeah. Right. And um, and there is there's an ironic uh, 
There's an irony to all of this. Now, this goes down to my personal opinions, which nobody really cares about, I'm sure. But <laughs> there is this sense that... I care. <laughs> Share them with me, Antonia. I care. That women are empowered and strong and shouldn't take anything from anybody. And simultaneously, they're too fragile to absorb a joke. Right. And I don't think that being too fragile to absorb a joke, regardless of why, I don't care if the person has, you know, like like a, a, a condition. Right. Like I have I, I think we should all be able to laugh at our foibles and our imperfections, including things that are, have struck us. I mean, I I have joked about probably things that are abominable to other people as a part of the way to relieve tension around those things. And uh, and to be a strong, empowered person, and I would even argue a strong, empowered woman means being able, having having enough resource to be able to absorb a certain amount of being picked at, right? Being the the object of a joke. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily mean spirited, and even if it had been, I think an I think a strong woman. I mean, that's the definition of strength, right? The ability to get through things that you kind of have to take some arrows and some hits. And so the idea that a person is too high a station and or too fragile to be able to absorb that kind of situation, I think is part of what we're talking about. This place that we've gotten where everything is trauma with a capital T, everything is sacred, everything's a sacred cow, you're not allowed to touch anything. And that's and that's a really weird, ironic message set side by side with this idea that we're all so strong and empowered. Which one is it? Are we strong and empowered or are we fragile and unable to absorb anything? Those two things, I think, are I mean, they're in some ways they're kind of mutually exclusive. That said, I think this idea that uh, that we are split on whether or not that was acceptable behavior you know, I mean, I think everybody was like, well, you shouldn't have slapped him. You know, it's so weird because we don't usually talk about things like this. <laughs> uh, well, and you're also assuming that she was the one triggered. I mean, he's the one that took the action. We're assuming she also felt bad about that based on pattern recognition, not knowing she didn't say it in the moment. It's not evidential. Right. Yeah. I, and and uh, and maybe she could absorb it and he couldn't. Yeah. Uh, who knows why? I ha I mean... There's only a, a limited set number of nodes in a system like that running, and um, a, a node in the system is unlikely to be. She didn't give two craps. That's unlikely to be a node in the system, but uh, but it doesn't matter. And I kind of want to get beyond this. Like, so it's not even a subject de jour. It happened like months ago, I think. At this point, <laughs> even when we're topical and timely, we're not topical and timely. But using it as an example of what we're, we're discussing in society. Yes, there's this idea that um, that when we are triggered, it is always the person who did the triggering that is at fault, at least with a certain subset of society. They believe that everybody should be walked around like somebody with a twisted ankle. Mm. And then there's another subset of society that almost, I mean, because they hate that so much, they're the annoyed roommate that, hey, can you get me a cup of tea? I have a twisted ankle. Will, you know, huff and puff and like throw a, a pillow at you, not caring if it hits your ankle or not. So there's a, th there is definitely a split. And, and which one is the, is the right call? And the answer is both and neither simultaneously. It's not a matter of how we deal with triggers with a line under the word trigger, meaning that like every trigger is, you know, dealt with, and given equal weight, it's actually a case by case basis, and um, and when you look at it in terms of other people, there is something to be said for being cautious and knowing your audience and knowing the person you're dealing with and whether or not you're going to hurt their their feelings. There is something to be said for not like attacking people you don't know very well, or you know, or being harsh with strangers because you don't know what kind of day they've had, that kind of thing. And at the same time, when we're applying it to the self, I think we need to separate ourselves out from this entire societal perspective of, well, if I'm easy to trigger, I there's a certain percentage of the population that is immediately going to run to my aid. And, oh, that's kind of a nice benefit. That's a nice perk of being highly triggerable. Now, I don't know anybody who's going to own that. Most people will not own that at all. 
they'll they'll go, no, 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 it's because I'm really fragile. <laughs> no, no, they're not going to own that they're fragile either. <laughs> That's the crazy thing. Anybody who falls in this category of somebody who is um, easily triggered all the time will neither own that they're fragile nor will they own that they're doing it for social capital. Yeah. And it's like, it's well, what else is it? Okay. So you're either, and it doesn't mean you're a fragile person. It just means that in this moment, you are fragile in this moment and you have to own that. It's a, it's a, it's like a, um, if you're going to own the trigger, trigger, you have to own the, the, um, uh, the disability, right? If you twisted your ankle, you can't pretend like you can go play basketball later that day. You've got to own that you're in a bad space. And you have to own that it's your responsibility to heal from it. And I think that's one of the reasons why we don't really want to own either of those things. We don't want to own that we're doing it for social capital, but we also don't want to own that if I am currently fragile, it is my job to get strong again. It's my job to get resilient or to be resilient and get strong on the other side. And so now we're just sort of in this limbo. And because we're in this limbo, we don't really know how to deal with triggers other than to get upset with them and then have these perpetual battles of whether or not everybody's oversensitive and coddled or whether or not everybody's just being a big jerk and not acknowledging the true pain that people are experiencing. One of the interesting things about recording a show like this is we're trying to go meta on the idea of triggers. <laughs> and I assume that even going meta on triggers and talking about them in the, ab in the abstract somebody is going to be listening or watching this and is going to be triggered about the conversation about triggers, right? Yep. It's going gonna, it's gonna to happen <laughs> inevitably. So let's talk a little bit about, before we recorded, I just wrote down like four little steps in what I think happens for most people when they get triggered. Well, before you go into that, I do want to make a statement that the societal component of triggers is only interesting in the, in the sense that have we absorbed society's opinions on this? and then now personalize them. And now we have allowed how society feels about it with all of its agendas and all of its motivations and intentions and all the things that you know, swirl around in the collective unconscious. Are we outsourcing our opinions of triggers onto, you know, like, like are we outsourcing our feelings about this to society? You and me or people in general? People in general. And I want to first state that I think that disconnecting our def you know like how we feel about triggers from the rest of society and sitting with it on our own personalizing it personalizing it realizing that there is a facility for literally everything we experience otherwise it wouldn't be an experience it wouldn't exist if it wasn't serving us in some way at some time and so I want to go back to the previous statement that we made that triggers are not always bad. In fact, if we don't allow ourselves to get triggered and move through those things, we create a f we create fragility inside of us. Just like somebody who acts like their ankle is twisted even when it's not, and then now their legs atrophy. Right? They can't use them anymore. So pushing like 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 pushing against hard times being resilient, allowing ourselves to get triggered and have to move through it is one of the best ways to not be triggerable at all. And so we're going to go into, um, uh, we're just going to shift the topic into a more personalized experience with that. And we get asked all the time, Joel, Antonia, I understand my personality type. What about the shadow functions? What about the shadow of myself? How do I get into the shadow? Jungian concepts around shadow work. What do I work on? How do I know what to focus on? How do I know to find my shadow? Where is my shadow? What comes up in my shadow? Triggers are the pathway to the shadow. Right. If, you ask, if you're asking, how do I get into my shadow? How do I get into the functions that aren't in the four front, you know, the, the four passenger car of my car model, the, the original cognitive function stack, those other four functions or the shadow of my life, how do I find that? Triggers are the answer. That's what we're talking about on a personal level, not societal. For you to access your shadow, use triggers, get triggered, have something surface out of your shadow, address it, process it, get through it, move on. This is how we deal with things in personal growth. This is, this is like the pathway forward. So let's talk about the process. How does this look? We jotted down these four steps. First, usually we come with an attitude toward the thing that's triggering us. And then that results in an avoidance strategy. So often when something is triggering you in the world, you have an attitude, this is not good. I shouldn't be triggered. I need to avoid it at all costs. And this is something I think a lot of people end up doing. They try to avoid having 
the things come into their lives that will trigger that response in them. The second thing I think a lot of people do is it's more action-based. They attempt to control the environment or the situations they're in to prevent that trigger, diminish it, push it away, blame other people for causing it in them. So like you made the you you made it bad because you caused this in me, whatever. And you create a control mechanism to try to stop it from happening at all. Right. This is called projection. <laughs> it's a thing that's inside of you, but you've made somebody else the bad guy because they reminded you of its existence. Yeah. And then I think the next thing we do is we go down to a narrative level where we we try to reframe or redefine it, maybe even calling it a, a, a bad thing on the other person. Like It's a little bit like the control side, right? You control your environment, but now you're projecting things on other people. You're bad. You're wrong. Uh, you're actually at fault for causing this trigger. I know you just spoke truth, but truth is bad in this situation. You can't speak that. You can't say that word. You can't say that thing. You can't do that thing. You're trying to reframe the entire concept, almost, almost categorically trying to make it bad and wrong at a high level so that it just doesn't come up anymore. It's like a, it's like a second level of control almost. Yeah, well, we've done that with the concept of triggers itself. We've sure. reframed them. We, we're Now, instead of controlling people's behavior, we've tried to control the narrative that if a person triggers another individual, then they have automatically done them a disservice. And that's a form of, of it's uh, instead of cr controlling actions, it's controlling narratives. So yes, absolutely. So we avoid, we try to control, we try to reframe or redefine. And then I think the last piece, if none of those things work, because I think they're almost like, we try them in stacking order. Like we try avoid first, if it doesn't work, we try to control. We can't control, we try to reframe or recategorize. If those don't work, Eventually, we accept, we own, and we, I, we amplify. So I get triggered around something in my life, and now it becomes almost like the cause of my life, or I own it as my identity. I own, oh yeah, I'm fill in the blank, the thing that's triggering me, or the thing that I feel weird about. I go ahead and own it, I accept it, but now I'm, I make it my identity, and I almost take like a victim viewpoint from it. So I'm coming from like a victim stance on this thing. Right. And I think that's also a really insidious place that tr triggers get to. When we get triggered and we start to identify with them so much that we own them, amplify them, almost like accept them, like I'm just gonna be this whatever way that's causing this, now we're at identity level. It's really hard to change. Yeah, well, and then it loops back on itself, right? Once it gets to identif identity level, then everybody should know this about you and they should be helping you avoid those triggers. And um, I'm going to say another thing that's relatively top, timely and top, I mean, not timely or topical, but something that is not necessarily quote unquote evergreen. I mean, if you're listening to this 50 years in the future, you'll have no idea what I'm talking about. But there's a YouTube video um, that ha like showcases the 2018 Democratic Socialist Convention. And if you want to see all four of these responses to triggers in action, just watch that. Now, I don't have anything, I don't have any opinions politically on democratic socialists. Uh, I don't really care. But that convention certainly showed how people were do, like doing cartwheels to avoid triggers. They were trying to control the environment to ensure that no trigger happened. They were um, creating a frame. They had reframed all triggers to being aggressive and assaulting to other people. And they owned it completely and turned it into an identity. It was like their identity as a collective that they were not going to have triggers. And then, of course, it just turns itself into a hamster wheel, right? Looping, 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 looping. And, um, and so interestingly enough, and I think this is a perfect illustration of how avoiding triggers and going down through all these layers ends up doing more harm than good. It took them literally hours to establish even basic rules of conduct at their convention because they were so focused on ensuring that triggers were not going to be, um, you know, that they were never going to cause a trigger. But of course, they ended up triggering everybody because they couldn't establish anything. And so everybody wasn't triggered by incidentals. They were triggered by the experience, which is what happens. Um, it's the old Carl Jung, you know, quote, which... Um, I, I don't remember if I've got the entire thing, and I'm, I'm probably paraphrasing, but it's basically the what you resist persists principle. If you are trying to avoid triggers, well, they're going to come at you as a tsunami. And the more you get insistent that you can avoid them and everybody else needs to be in on this with you to avoid them, the more they're coming for you.
So let's get down again, more brass tacks. I think one of the things that really helps people is good examples. The challenge with examples of triggers is they're triggering. <laughs> like every example I can think of to articulate, I'm like, wow, that's going to make somebody really frustrated. That's going to trigger somebody. And while we're suggesting you run around and get yourself triggered, our goal here is not necessarily to have a sound bite. It's going to be replicated over and over again to trigger people. Although we want you to be triggered on this episode. So there was a, there's maybe a good example is a Twitter post you made recently. Antonio. We don't want people to be triggered by the episode. We want to convince people that triggering is yes. actually at times Thank you. Yes. the right thing. And I know I understand why you would be in particular sensitive to not wanting to trigger other people. I get that. Well, first of all, I want to be a kind person. Right. And like in general. Yeah. And you've got feeling preferences and, you know, but I can be the jerk thinker in this context and I can go ahead and shamelessly trigger people. Um, and I and I think it helps that I'm a woman. Right. Because uh, I think I mean, honestly, th to some extent, this is a bit of a gendered conversation. Not entirely. Plenty of people from all over the map get triggered. Um, this is a time period for it. But I think as a thinker woman, I get a little bit more leeway. So I recently um, I recently made a tweet about how I thought it was important. In fact, I just made the recommendation. Whoever has an opinion that is 180 degrees from your worldview, right? Like people who have radically different paradigms, you should uh, you should follow them for at least one year. And as you read their tweets and messages, you should um, you should honestly ask yourself how that person could be right and how you could be wrong. And I just ended it with um, kill your intellectual darlings and reclaim your integrity. And that, that was your tweet? That was my tweet. That caused triggers in people? Yeah. A little wow. bit. Not tons, but somebody came along and they're like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> now, I don't know how emotionally it was triggering it was, um, but it was, uh, but I say stuff like that all the time on Twitter and then, you know, I get, I get v varied responses. Uh, that said, um, I don't think it takes much anymore for people to, now that could have just been somebody who truly thinks I'm ridiculous and that's fine. But uh, th that's like probably one of the most benign and mundane. But I think that there are all sorts of, I mean, I recently talked about how I think that, uh, I think that women get triggered too easily when they're approached by men. I do. I think that they act like men are the enemy and they have this story in their head that they're constantly and perpetually being hit on. And they just want to get through their day and, uh, you know, and I guess a person that they didn't want approaching them approached them at a moment that they didn't want to be approached. And um, and then this, this is like this is truly upsetting. It's not just like, a, oh, well, I, you know, I smiled and I was friendly and then they went away. Yeah, there are people out there who won't take no for an answer. And to some extent, like, you know, that's salesmanship. And also you can be very clear. And you can't. And if something is a dangerous situation, then you need to get out of that dangerous situation. But just being approached for some people is enough. It's enough. It's highly triggering to them. Being casually touched is enough. It's highly triggering. There's a lot of things that are relatively benign that will create, you know, this like experience of of reliving trauma. And I, I uh, and then there's a whole subset of people who get triggered in behalf of the person who is triggered. Do you know what I mean? It's that, almost that's like, the one I don't understand. Like yeah. people that vicariously get triggered well, on others' behalf. Yeah, it didn't even happen to you. Triggering is contagious. It's like a yawn, right? And I think in part it's because we have these two components. We're very fragile, and when somebody else gets picked on, we identify with with the situation and our fragility comes up for us. And so it is It is a preciousness that we are generally dealing with. And that's understandable. I mean, we live in a very, we live in a very uh, synthetic world that doesn't really give us a relationship to the grittiness of what reality has been for humans for most of reality, you know, most of time. So we're so many degrees of separation from like, the physical grit that is required to exist, that now we're in a place where, you know, like our emotions and our psychology follow our bodies. It really do. And if we don't have physical grit, if we don't have an ability to have endurance, um, now 
that's not to say that somebody who's dealing with a disability is unable to because I would actually argue that people who are dealing with physical disabilities have a lot more emotional and mental grit than everybody else does because they have to be resilient. They have to deal with this physical pain all the time or this, you know, this limitation. And so they're, they're usually people who show high resilience and then they become these incredible, inspiring people emotionally and psychologically. And everybody's like, oh, I wish I had what they had. And it's like, well, it's because they're showing physical grit. <laughs> they're showing resilience. And we can do that too. It's just that our baseline starts out higher. And so we have to push ourselves further. And when we don't do that, when we don't have physical grit, our emotions and our psychology almost always follow that. So we're at a place right now where we just are not tapped into what it takes to survive or what it always took to survive. And what our pre-wiring, like our, our, our minds are paleolithic, right? Like we're, we're still expecting the world to be that hard. And when it's not hard, we get soft and we get soft in all these different ways. Now, I know that also will be triggering to somebody because they don't like the idea that we are too soft to deal with the basics. But I would argue we are. It's very clear because we're having a conversation around getting triggered over tiny little things. So there is a lack of grit generally. And um, and that preciousness has become something we create codependence around. We are codependent on our own preciousness. We're codependent on our own lack of grit while simultaneously dealing with all that ancient trauma, right? We are we are actually dealing with a lot of bad stuff that we're trying to cycle through. And also, we might be ill-equipped to do so because we are soft. So it's like a bunch of nodes in the system are running at the same time. That said, at the same time, we are also dealing with the social component of being rewarded for our, you know, for getting triggered. Like that, that sends the other percentage of people on high alert and now there's social capital wrapped up into it, as mentioned before. So it, we're codependent on this entire system. It's complex. It, it's so complex. It's so complex. And there's so many nodes in the system. And all we experience is the result, which is fragility and meanness, right? Fragility and meanness, fragility and meanness. That's what it is. It feels like, it feels like a, a, an overly easy and an over, over harshness simultaneously. And one begets the other. And why is that? Because they're shadows of each other. Right. The, the truth is that we need to come in the middle someplace. There is a tension point between both of the, both the preciousness and the harshness. If we can get them in a good balance, then we become people who own themselves and are resilient and know what we can deal with, are truly powerful, truly empowered. Right. Can handle our own stuff, can get over all of these little emotional, you know, dings. And, uh, and then we don't get triggered. Like, like the two polarities of extraordinary harshness and extraordinary preciousness in the center is untriggerableness, right? If we get that balance right. So, but sometimes we have to go through the hard work of getting beyond our triggers, which is why we think triggers can sometimes be a good thing. So to go back to the model that we just talked about, which is that we have an attitude of avoidance and then we have a desire to control actions, other people, and then we need to control the narrative and set a meta frame that this is unacceptable or you guys are picking on something that shouldn't be picked on. And then finally, we end up in that place of um, just owning it. And it's now our identity. I am the kind of person who, right? And it's defined by the trigger. There's a way to ameliorate this. There's a way to, to find that tension point in the center, but you have to go through the trigger. You have to, as opposed to avoiding it, you have to welcome it. And the reason why we avoid triggers is like you said, you want to do shadow work? Triggers are how to get there. Well, we avoid triggers because we want to be blissfully unaware of our shadow, right? It's like, that's the model. That's how you get there. Yeah. Well, as much as I say I want to do personal growth work, I don't want to do shadow work, right? I don't want to look at any of that. But then, of course, we get controlled by the shadows that are we are unconscious around. Those things now start to control us. And the preciousness and fragility and the harshness and the meanness and pull yourself up by your bootstraps or whatever it is, those things are shadows of each other. And because both refuse to do shadow work, right, because those, those harsh people, those are people who are getting triggered all the time, too. They're getting triggered by other people's preciousness, 
right? They're also getting triggered. They're just responding differently. And they won't call them triggers because they want to deny that's what's happening, but that is also what's happening. You can see that. You can see that on every side of the aisle. Draw a line, put two camps on each side, and what you have is two camps that are getting triggered constantly by each other, usually. They're almost always in reaction to each other. The center point, the middle point, is not allowing yourself to, um, to escape your shadow work by not turning away, by seeing it and looking at it. So there is a corollary model. If you're going to go through attitude and then action and then narrative and then identity, there is a corollary version of that that isn't avoidance, but it's welcoming. So it's being open. If it's avoidance as the strategy, the first initial strategy to not have to deal with a trigger that comes up because the trigger's happening. But if you can avoid the trigger, maybe you don't have to look at what, what it brings up to you. So you attempt to avoid. And what we're saying is we want to change our avoidance strategy to a welcoming and openness. I'm open to triggers. I'm open to this in my life. I actually, when I see a trigger, I'm not going to avoid it and run away. I'm going to go ahead and embrace it. What material surfaces when that trigger happens? And that openness will lead me to that. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, Knowing that these triggers, even the ones that are capital T trauma, now that's a whole different ball of wax. That's usually years of work, healing work. But even those need not to be forever avoided. Well, And the goal is to overcome them. Right. It's not to have them and hold them and harbor them forever. It's to go get the professional help so you can heal from them. Which, exactly. Which really takes us to the next place where if we're going to avoid it, that doesn't work, and we try to control as the next stage or the next step, instead of control, we could alter that to say, let's process the material that surfaces with the trigger. Let's process what's triggered in us. So I get triggered, something happens in the outside world, it, it comes up for me, I'm open to it, seeing it, I look at it directly, the shadow, and I go, I need to process this in my life. And there's a ton of tools and resources for that, emotional process release, Tapping, meditation, breath work, yoga, medi- like all sorts of technologies exist for us to process shadow material that surfaces for us. Yeah. And the intense stuff can be done through cognitive behavioral therapy. That's the point of that, that entire therapy is to create a process for dealing with these triggers. And so, yeah, as opposed to trying to control the environment to not do, you know, not to assault you with this, instead, you, uh, you, are a you are a person of agency that chooses to go through a process and now you don't have to control the environment the environment is no longer your challenge what the challenge is is getting through the trigger itself getting yeah. through the healing work that you need to do on your own and what's happening there is controlling the environment all the all the structure and technique is out here and we say learn how to process the emotions or the things that come up for you when you're triggered We're bringing the tools and the processes inside of ourselves, meaning we can go anywhere. We don't need the external world to help us deal with our triggers. We can be in any context, any situation. If we have the internal tools to process them, well, now we're empowered. We move through the world in an empowered way. We're free. We're no longer uh, a victim to our circumstances or context or the tools outside of ourselves. We have them within. Of course, when you're dealing with those intense traumas, there's tools like cognitive behavioral therapy that can help you. Um, and I think learning processes and tools in my life personally has been powerful, like some of the ones I just mentioned. These are the strategies I use when I get triggered, something surfaces, I look at it, I deal with it. Now, I, I still sometimes don't. Like we all have these experiences where we don't actually work through those triggers, but processing it has taken me 10x in my personal growth journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, and it takes you 10x because it's hard. Mm-hmm. Right. Like you get the return on investment because you're investing a lot. Oh, oh. And the other benefit to to this, too, is uh, things that used to trigger me don't Mm -hmm. like the trigger has to be more sophisticated now to get to me. You got it. That's the big thing I got from learning how to process my emotions that surfaced is eventually doing it over and over again. They they diminish. They go away. Mm -hmm. And that is boom, mind blowing. Like I don't have to deal with this same trigger forever. It's actually higher and higher levels of triggers than now I'm dealing with in my life. Right, because you processed the earlier stuff. You made the unconscious conscious. You brought things that were, you know, sort of 
jerking your chain from the shadows, you brought them into the light and said, okay, as opposed to perpetually avoiding you and staying blissfully unaware that you exist, I'm going to actually look at you and realize it wasn't bliss when I was unaware of you. It was painful. And I had to work overtime to control other people to try to keep them from hitting these triggers. So I'm going to look at them directly and I'm going to process it. It's incredibly painful, but so is hitting the gym right? Hitting the gym, there's a reason why you're sore. And the first times you do it, there's a reason why two days afterwards you can barely walk right after leg day. It's because you're ripping muscles. It is, it is a little bit of trauma to the body, but it's a form of trauma that builds strength. It's not avoiding trauma. It's resting into small amounts of trauma in order to build more and more physical stamina, endurance, resilience, muscle, and there is a corollary to psychological and emotional work. It is allowing yourself to be exposed to lower grade traumas to do the work you need to do to get to the other side in order to be able to deal with all those little things that don't feel like trauma anymore. You hit the gym long enough, all of a sudden stuff that was like super difficult to lift before, or maybe it was difficult to run around with your kids and you get winded or whatever it is. Now suddenly those things are not problems because you have put yourself in the path of dealing with the, you know, those situations and building stamina around it. So if you can get to a place where you process your smaller traumas, suddenly smaller traumas aren't a thing anymore, right? And it's painful. It is intentionally painful. That's its purpose. Its purpose is to inure you to low-grade pain. And a lot of the things that people are experiencing, whether it's their own challenges or it's borrowed or it's a contagion or it's generational or ancestral or whatever it is, we all need to get better at dealing with them because apparently we're the moment in the timeline when all this stuff is coming up, right? We're, if we're going to be the generation that's te- you know, like really dealing with all this ancient wounding and trauma, if we're finally going to start paying attention to it, well, then we're going to have to build the resilience to be able to deal with it because it, it was hard stuff that got everybody there and it's going to be hard stuff that gets us out. So processing trauma is maybe one of the most crucial things we can do as a gift to ourselves individually and as, you know, a gift to society collectively. But it's not easy, right? Just like hitting the gym isn't easy, right? Everybody will kick that can if they can get away with it. Everybody's going to kick the can of triggers if they can get away with it. Everybody's going to avoid their shadow if they can get away with it. And yet it is critical, crucial work. I think the skill that we're attempting to relay to you listening is the ability for you to get triggered, maybe even seek it out, have it surface, and then know exactly what to do in that moment, right? Part of it can be gratitude for the trigger. Part of it can be pulling on the resources and tools to process it like we talked about. And then building that discipline. So it doesn't matter the subject matter. It doesn't matter the level of trigger, whether it's low grade. If you are triggered by a lot of what I would consider maybe surface things, now you might interpret them as really big deals in your life. Maybe I would interpret them differently, but I'm at a different level. So whatever the trigger is for you is for you. It's the real thing. It is what's coming up. It doesn't matter if I would see it like, well, that shouldn't trigger you. The should statements don't matter. It did trigger you. Something surfaced. And having the skill of how to process that is what we hope you can take away from this podcast, this recording, because we're not assuming you're going to solve all of your emotional problems by getting triggered. And we're not even focusing you. I don't think I'm focusing you listening on the end result of being through all these things, although that is what will happen eventually. Right now, this is a wax on, wax off karate kid moment. Hmm. Just focus on how do I process emotional stuff that comes up when I get triggered at whatever level that is. Well, and stop making it other people's problem, yeah. right? Because that's the thing that we do when we're trying to control the environment to keep us from getting those moments is that we project we project our shadows onto others. You triggered me, so you're the bad guy. Well, maybe they just existed and you got triggered and you've got some stuff inside that needs to be addressed. And yeah. so I, th- I think it not, only, it not only makes us more resilient people, but it also... You know, it avoids a lot of discord. Yeah. Because how much, how many of our arguments have nothing to do with the other person? It's a hundred percent on us, but we just made them the bad guy because we were trying to stay blissfully unaware of our shadow. Yeah. So I think it's also about interpersonal relationships. That next level 
when we're in avoidance. We go from avoidance to control, and then we try to reframe. We try to make it so that everybody thinks this is a big deal, and everybody should avoid talking about it. You can see this with all sorts of fads right now of how we're supposed to be. I would say physical health right now is in a massive anti-trigger reframe about how things that we all know are not healthy are being reframed as healthy, right? Like terrible diets, terrible foods. You know, like I, I saw it's like, it's okay to get your your daily water from food. And it's like, what, you're not drinking water now? <laughs> like, that's what we're going to do. So there's a lot of stuff that right now is being reframed in order to avoid the trigger. It's like, well, if I can't control people from saying this to me, then I'm just going to try to control their thoughts. But if you're going to a more empowered frame, right, you're not avoiding the triggers, you're accepting them. In fact, you're welcoming them if you're resourced in that moment. If you're not resourced, you know, like if you're exhausted, that's not the time to hit the gym. But if you're resourced, hit the gym, right? And so you go from, you know, welcoming them to processing them. And then when you hit the narrative moment, as opposed to the desire to reframe and spin it in your favor, now you're reframing that this isn't from without. This is not a situation I'm experiencing outside of me that I have to control or try to, you know, either through action or narrative out here. I actually have to understand that this isn't my identity. It is something that lives within, though, and I need to integrate it. I need to integrate the experience. I need to integrate my opinion of myself. A lot of these modern day triggers are about self-esteem and self-worth. I need to integrate that for some reason. I'm either outsourcing my self-esteem to other people and self-value to others, and I need to bring that in-house, not in a, uh, you know, I get to set the rules for how all of society responds to everything, right? I get to redefine reality, but more like I need to understand that I'm the only person who can really, truly self-validate. So maybe I should figure that out. So it's integrating all of these things, but it's also understanding that the thing that might be off, it might not be that other people are being mean. It might be that we don't actually, we're not individuated, we have cognitive dissonance. We're split, right? The reason why we're feeling low self-esteem isn't because everybody told us we were bad. It's because we're not doing the actions we know that we need to do to ameliorate ourselves, to be proud of ourselves. And we need to own that, right? Am I taking, am I, am I doing everything I can not to be some concept of perfection of like Instagram perfect with like the perfect body and the perfect house and the perfect partner and the perfect kids and the perfect career and the per blah, 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 right? Like this unreality that we have set up in front of us. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about asking ourselves what it is that we as a human being truly value. What do I actually value? If I separate myself from societal expectations, if I separate myself from all the messages I've been given, if I separate myself from all of this like propaganda everywhere, and I just sat down and I go, uh, I think what I value is kindness. Am I a kind person? Nope. I've been trying to control everybody to not trigger me, and I've been kind of a dick about it. I've been a bit of an asshole. Right? It was self-protective. It came from my shadow. Right, It was just me trying to protect myself. And also, I'm not living up to my value of kindness right? or honesty or integrity or maybe health. Right, There's a bunch of people who are trying to change a narrative, not because they worry about how other people see them, but because they're not matching their expectations of health for themselves. So now I've got work to do. Right. And I can't just reframe everybody, everything and everybody and tell them how it's going to be. That's the easy way out, so to speak. I mean, try to change everybody on the planet's opinion. Right. Like that's going to be that. that's quite a feat. <laughs> Some people are trying. <laughs> Some people are trying. Right. But actually, what's truly easier is to just get to work on becoming the person that you were intended to be. Just get to work on manifesting a person that you feel proud of. And just making the decision to do that should make you feel proud of yourself. Just deciding you're going to go down a road of self-amelioration. Just deciding you're going to be the kind of person who's done convincing yourself of an unreality and living as a fantasist. Just going, you know what? I think I need to get to work. <laughs>
that alone will give you a boost of self-esteem and self-confidence because now you're empowered. Now you're sovereign. Now you are taking you're taking your destiny back in your own hands as opposed to calling everything fate. And so that's integrating, right? It's altering the narrative not out here. It's altering the narrative in here, right? And that integration work, it's, it's like you just get this spike of empowerment. It just runs through you. And then finally, as opposed to turning it into an identity, right? I'm the kind of person and then, you know, name the trigger, name all of the things around the trigger and then say that that's who I am as a human being. Not a thing I have, not something that lives inside my shadow, but this is who I am and, and turning it into a noun, an anomalization, an identity. Instead of doing that, we actually disidentify with it. We create a separation of who we are and this thing we got triggered by, right? This thing that happened to us, this thing that is a belief, right? We don't over-identify with our beliefs. We don't over-identify with our emotions. We don't over-identify with our actions or the things that happen to us, right? We, we create a separation. We know we're not that. We are us. It's, uh, there's that example of somebody that has a terminal illness, that says, I don't want to be defined as the person that has, quote unquote, fill in whatever terminal illness. Right. I want to be me mm -hmm. that happens to also have this terminal illness. That's right. not my definition. That's not who I am. I don't want to be treated as that's my only showing up in life. Right. I think that's what you're speaking to is we don't need to over identify with something that's a trigger for us or emotional turmoil in our lives. Yep. We can say, yeah, that's an aspect of my life. Sometimes I get triggered around that. I deal with it and I'm working on it in my life, but that's not the sum total of who I am. Right. That said, your character will show up when it's dealing with these things. You might not be your trigger, but you might be the kind of person who doesn't deal with triggers, right? Or you might be the kind of person who does deal with them, who does process them. And you can accept that as a, as a part of your characteristic, right? Like that is a character. Uh, asset to deal with triggers. And so then once you disidentify, now you don't have to hold on to it. Now it now it's not cloying to you. Now you can let it go. And like you said, once you get through that process enough times, all of a sudden the triggers aren't even happening anymore. Right? You're going through that process so quickly. On the other side, you're resilient and you don't even experience them. In fact, you get untriggerable at a certain place. Now, nobody's 100% untriggerable. <laughs> everybody's got triggers because everybody's got shadow right? It doesn't matter how much of the unconscious you've made conscious, there's always more content for you there. But you get to a place where you start to welcome it because you know that the more you make the unconscious conscious, the more you dive into that shadow work, the more you see all of these things, the more resilient you are in your conscious waking life, the more you can handle, the more you can deal with, the more empowered you feel, the more honest it all becomes. It's authentic and honest empowerment, not I'm an empowered person and then watch me go ape on you when I didn't get what I want. I think that's why the skill of knowing how to see a trigger, identify it, process it, deal with it in your life basically is such a powerful skill because it is infinitely usable into the future. Mm -hmm. Like learning how to exercise and build strength in my body. I had a friend recently show me in the gym how to do a few techniques. So I'm working at it right now. I'm not seeing results yet, but I'm sticking Love with it. The, I'm sticking with the plan. You <laughs> mentioned leg day earlier. I'm like, I'm like five days in. Is, are my legs supposed to still be hurting? <laughs> Hopefully this, you know, it's like right now it's like intense, but I guess the more I work out, the less I'll feel that soreness. But there's never going to be a point in the future when I could just completely stop working out. No. If I want to stay healthy and strong, I, I have to keep challenging my body in those ways. But I won't have to come from a beginner's time period either. Like I'll already have techniques, tools. I'll, I'll know what I'm doing. It'll be in my like literal muscle memory. I'll know what I'm going through in the gym. And I'll always have to keep the tension on and the strength training. But my guess is that it won't be as intense as it is right now as I'm getting started in a lot of ways. Yeah. So I think that's a good example of this, that the skill of understanding and dealing with triggers is a gift that will keep giving to you for the rest of your life. And if you get good enough at it, you can also teach others how to deal with triggers, your children someday or now, right? Or partners, friends, family. You're able to contribute to others dealing with triggers as well. And maybe scale it up to, you know, group trigger work or other things that we can do with it once we know on an individual level how to deal with these things. Well, and I've noticed that people who have done this kind of work 
are actually very sympathetic and compassionate to people who are dealing with triggers. Yeah. They're not mean. They're not aggressive. They're not you know, angsty and de- deliberately want those people to feel pain or hurt. And they're also, they don't treat them with kid gloves because they know the reward of walking through the process. So they have found that tension point in between. They're not precious, but they're also not brutish. They found that they found that place in that lives in the tension point between those two spaces. And that tensions point point is usually kindness it's like true kindness you don't sugarcoat anything you do what's in the other person's best interest you aren't you know you don't coddle anybody because coddling is actually for us not for them it makes us feel good right so we're not coddling but at the same time we know what it means to because we've faced our demons we've looked our shadow in the eye and we know what it feels like to feel pain and hurt and so nobody's nobody in that space is going to be intentionally caustic and the more people can find that tension point Consider how much of that ancient trauma we could actually work through. Consider how much of like the mental health issues that are becoming such a ravishing problem in our modern, in our, in our contemporary wor- world. How many of those could we help people get through? How many resources and tools could we identify that are the real tools for the job? Not these like, you know, paper mache sort of painting over and hoping that gilding it will actually solve the problem. Like this is a place of solutions, not a place of, you know, avoiding our shadow, looking away, hoping it will take care of itself, blaming everybody else. This is a place of solutions. And so um, to me, it's a it's an important thing to make peace with, not because I want people to be not easy to trigger. Right. It's not because I want to be able to say whatever I want to say whenever I want to say it. Although I do like that idea, <laughs> but it's more because I honestly believe that it is it is one of the foundational core principle components that we need to to have as a healthy, thriving society. We really need this, and so um, so I I I hope that at least at least one person got persuaded to go. You know what? You're right. I think I have been avoiding triggers. I think I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna reevaluate this and reevaluate my relationship to them. So this episode went a little long because we're talking about a complex topic mm. that could be triggering. So we <laughs> want to take the time anytime we mention something to really give it attention. So it went a little long, and that means we didn't get to jump into the discussion around personality types and triggers. And maybe there's a pattern for the types of material that will trigger certain personality types. Mm. I'd love to still talk about that. Let's do it. On a future episode. Yeah, let's do it. But in the meantime, what did you think? You've been listening along. You haven't had a microphone, but you've been the third person in this conversation. I was going to say, what is triggering you? (laughs) (laughs) What's triggering you about this conversation? What What is it? What's coming up for you? Triggering you like what's kicking an idea off in your mind? What is bringing things up for you? It It may actually be a literal trigger. Uh, It might be just a thought that's coming up for you, maybe something you've worked through in your life. Where are you at in your journey with triggers, with the things that come up from your shadow? How do you deal with them? Do you avoid? Do you control? Do you reframe? Do you identify with it strongly? Or do you alchemize those things and do you move it over into more being open, processing it, uh, having a good narrative for it, and then really disidentifying with it? What's your strategy typically? Are you stratified? Maybe you have a mix of some of those strategies. We'd love to hear from you. Come over to personalityhacker.com. Directly below this episode, leave your comment, ask a question. More importantly, I'd like to encourage you to share your personal story about this in your life. If you've got a story, more than just your opinion, stories are powerful because they give us a glimpse into the real. Uh, I think I think stories are atomized experiences of life. When we tell a story, it's a, it's a way for another person to have your experience vicariously through the story you tell. So come on over and make your voice heard. Hmm. And if you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, various Android platforms. And if you're watching us on YouTube, you can also subscribe to our channel. If you like to leave a rating and review, you can do that on iTunes. Um, And we have a book. It's called Personality Hacker. You can get it at all major book retailers. And if you'd like to leave a rating and review for that on Amazon or on Goodreads, that would also help us out a lot. I've never said subscribe to us on iTunes. And so now I'm like completely thrown off on my 
my script. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, well, if you're listening to this audio, we also are now starting a video version of the podcast that yeah. we're hosting on YouTube. Yeah. So and if so, you want to watch us do the podcast, you can also do that at our YouTube channel. That's right. It's a whole new world. Uh, so what do I usually say? Oh, uh, we talked about the book and we have a suite of programs that are personal growth oriented through the lens of personality type, meaning that all the stuff we're talking about, become a better version of yourself, uh, get through some of the major challenges that are associated with your personality type, really do good diagnostics on the challenges of your life and have a good prescription that is tailored to you and your personality type. If all that sounds good, head over to our, uh, our website, personalityhacker.com and see if there is a program that is right for you. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker Podcast. Mm-hmm.